Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Dr. David Song. Today we're going to be talking about knocked knees, particularly when you see it in a squat. So if you haven't seen my previous video, I go over uh, breaking down hip shift mechanics and one of the reasons can be due to a knocked knees position. So guys, the best way to really determine why you're getting knee valgus is to go get assessed by someone who knows their stuff. That's the gold standard. If you have access problems to finding that type of individual, another option you have, and the reason why I made this video, is to kind of just start doing a process of, of elimination to see if any of these things do in fact help your knee valgus. All the things we're going to be doing here is cause and effect. You, If you make a change, you should see an immediate difference in that knee valgus during your squat. If it doesn't, potentially it's not a functional knee valgus problem. There are structural reasons why you can get or why you can be in knee valgus. As I explained in my last video, it's not always just due to a weak glute problem or a glute activation problem. Anything can happen from the foot and working its kinetic chain all the way up to the hip. So today we're going to go over what might be happening at the foot. The first thing that can be happening is functional overpronation of your medial longitudinal arch. This is flattening of the foot functionally during the movement and this can cause internal rotation of your tibia which will pull the knee inwards towards the inner aspect of your body. This will also cause internal rotation of your femur. With my right foot over here, what you should notice is that when that arch collapses, my tibia here will internally rotate. And if I were to bend that knee thereafter, my knee will end up being in a valgus knee position, leading to also internal hip uh, rotation. I like to visualize the lean tower pizza. If the foundation is not really you know, stable, then the rest of the tower is going to be leaning in also. In this case, the foot is the foundation and that knee coming in is that tower. The main thing you want to look for and address in that is how well that foot can actually stay in supination or how well that foot can eccentrically contract. This is important because a foot should be pronating and it should be supinating. Both functions are very important for the foot. So it's important to really recognize that pronation shouldn't be demonized. It's not a bad thing. However, when you can't really control when it's happening or to what degree it's happening, then it can become a problem in your mechanics. During the squat, you do want to keep your arches as supinated as possible. And this is just to protect your knees. This is different from um, how your foot mechanics will be when you're walking, when you're lunging, when you're doing other types of exercises. This is very specific to the squat if you want a very solid foundation. The most important thing that we're going to look at for the foot is how well you can actually supinate the foot without relying on your other toes or even without relying on a lot of your calf muscles to help you with it. We are really going to look into using the intrinsic muscles of your foot. The exercise we're going to see this in is called a short foot. So we're going to be doing the short foot exercise here where you take a look at my foot, I have a fairly flat foot, but that's not a sit. Okay, so that's just a structurally flat foot. What we want to make sure is that it's not, it's not a functionally flat foot. The other thing is, you want to make sure the starting position of your knee is right over top of that ankle. If it isn't, and this knee moves outwards, it can give you the illusion of lifting up that arch, where it's just your knee actually manipulating what you're doing at the ankle. I have flat feet. Big whoop. Not the worst thing that can happen to you. However, when you take a look at my foot control, I'm actually able to lift that inner aspect of that uh, arch up and hold it there with out having to grab the floor with my toes. With this exercise, it's very important that when you go to lift the arches here, that you don't actually recruit uh, your, super, your superficial toe flexors. If you do see toe grabbing on the floor when you're doing it yourself, that or hammer toeing, I like to call it, then you are using those superficial toe flexors. Again, you don't want to rely on those because how often are you going to be able to just grip the toe of uh, the floor with your toes during your squat? If you end up recruiting your superficial toe flexors, they'll end up looking like your toes are gripping the floor and causing what's called a, ha a hammer toe, where the knuckle pops up at the front here. You might also notice that the ball of your foot will lift off as well, and that's a no-no. Since the arch kind of goes from your heel to the ball of your big toe, 
you want to make sure that those two aspects of your foot are always planted during this exercise. When you do the short foot, you should have complete freedom over your toes and be able to move them on command if you have that type of control without actually compromising your arch there. What I like to visualize is actually pulling the ball of your big toe towards your heels. With this, you take something that's flat and then you're trying to lift it up into a dome. Another thing you can do just to get your brain to kind of wire your, your muscular control over this is start to tap the inner aspect of that arch. This will bring some more biofeedback or proprioception um, from your skin to your brain and your brain back down to the muscles of your foot. You should feel that you can get a deeper contraction with this. Now this will likely be super hard the first time around for most people and it takes up to two or three weeks to really get a good hold over doing this on command. All right, so the second thing we're going to look at is eccentrically loading the foot. What this means is that the foot will actually go into pronation, but the whole time your foot supinators will be contracting. This provides you with a better launch pad uh, for when you do your activities. The arch should be collapsing and it should launch out of that back into supination, almost like a body's natural springboard just in your foot. This helps with like energy conservation, this helps with um, shock absorption. This helps you propel you forward. From here, what it looks like is you're going to place a plate, a workout plate, that gives you a little bit of elevation just underneath the ball of your big toe and below the heel of your foot in a half lunge position. To load up that medial longitudinal arch, you're going to lean in with your knee and let that arch collapse and bring that knee in towards your big toe. From here, it's very important that you go slowly and appreciate the burning slash stretching sensation that's going through your arch. From there, you actually want to use your foot muscles to contract and push you back into a supinated position as you lean back, both at the same time. What this does is it slowly loads that medial longitudinal arch as it stretches, allowing it to pronate down, and then you're contracting back out of it, creating that stable short foot. There's two ways to tar target what's going on at the foot and how that is leading to your knock knees position. The next thing we're going to look at that might be causing your knock knees is your hip adductors or your groin muscles. In your groin, you have your adductor magnus, adductor longus, uh, muscles that go from your groin down to your knee. These muscles are largely responsible for co-contracting co to stabilize the knee. These muscles are tight they can pull the knee inwards towards where the groin is located. So you actually get that pull inwards, leading to a knock knee position. The best way I like to target it is actually starting from the knee up to the groin and picking up both three or four of the tightest spots along that pathway. You're gonna hold that foam roller there and compress it for about 30 seconds or so before moving to the next spot. You don't wanna hold it for too long because the goal here is not to beat up the muscle. It's just to give it another type of afferent signal or another input so that the brain can register what the muscle is doing and help it to then relax afterwards. You're going to lie down on your on your stomach here, on supporting yourself with your elbow and your knees. You're going to place that foam roller along that inner thigh with that affected side um, coming outward just like this. From there, you're just going to roll onto a point that's fairly tender and you're just going to hold it for about 30 seconds or so. Try to breathe and relax into it as well before finding another spot and then repeating. I actually don't like to roll around on the whole muscle belly. I actually find it more effective to do what's called ischemic compression of the muscle, which is simply holding it for about 30 seconds, you move to the next spot. Shouldn't spend more than two minutes on this. And again, you'll only do this for about three or four spots. Following the foam rolling, if you were to go back and then retest your squat, you should notice that when you squat down, that the knees will no longer go inwards towards each other if there was indeed a tight hip adductor problem. If not, we recheck another test and see what's going on. The other thing that can happen with the hip adductors is their lack of ability to eccentrically contract, that is contracting while it's in an elongated, elongated position to stabilize the knee. Now this can be related to having a hip adductor, but inherently it's a different problem. For that, your body is not actually used to contracting that muscle while it's long. So it makes sense that your knee won't feel comfortable 
being outwards versus inwards. Your body just does, doesn't know how to recruit this muscle. A quick exercise to start working it are called groin sliders. If you are having difficulties with eccentrically contracting your hip adductor, this is a great one because as you lunge your leg out sideways, you're actually going to be stretching that hip adductor muscle. Then you're going to be forcing it to contract to pull your body back upright. Try not to lean as much as possible on this left leg or your opposing leg that you're using for support. Really, you're going to try to pull in from this inner thigh. So if you take a look, I'll be sliding my leg out into this side lunge position and I'm going to be appreciating that hip adductor stretch. And from there, I'm contracting it by pulling my leg right into the floor to lift my body up. And you should start to appreciate the contraction going on here. Now the first few times you do this, it can be a little bit rough, especially if you have trouble balancing, but that's okay. It tends to get better the more repetitions you do. As you continue to do this exercise, your brain should start connecting with this muscle group a lot more smoothly. Then if you recheck your squat, what you should notice is that that same affected knee will not be doing a knee valgus anymore if it was truly a hip adductor eccentric contraction problem. The last thing we're going to look at is actually glute engagement. So this is the one that's the most popularized problem uh, on the internet. You'll see tons of physios, tons of chiros, tons of personal trainers and coaches saying, hey, you're just not turning on your glute. If all those other issues did not help at all, then yeah, sure, I'll say potentially it's a glute engagement problem. The best way to start engaging it is actually to feed the dysfunction, which means you're going to force your knee to go into further knee valgus. What this will do is give you a little bit of uh, biofeedback again to the brain saying, hey, get those knees to push out. So the best thing that you can do is get a hip circle or a circular band or a regular band and tie it just above the knees. Don't put it right on the knees because your joint line might actually be a little bit sensitive. So either go right above or below. Make sure your knees are stacked over the mid middle of your foot you're actually going to be pushing outwards against that band's resistance. From here, you should be able to do a bodyweight squat without that knee being pulled into valgus. So the best way to actually see if you're doing this correctly is to do it right in front of a mirror so you can assess your own knee angle and push up against that band. During the exercise, you might actually feel a bit of a burn in that outer hip. Take that as a good sign. If it was indeed a glute engagement problem, you should be able to take off that band and recheck the squat after doing 15 to 20 repetitions. From there, you should be able to do a squat no problem. All right, so guys, that sums up everything I want to talk about about how to fix your knee valgus in a squat. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Subscribe, like, share this with your friends, and take a look at my other videos if you want more information. Cheers.